So, um, things that I'm going to talk about, um, why have a process at all around anything that we do? Because I think sometimes that's actually quite a good question to ask rather than just kind of barreling in and saying we should do this. Um, what do I think Agile is? What isn't it? Um, things that I've learned while I'm applying it. A few specifics around how um, we're working at the moment on FutureLearn and how we're incorporating pedagogy into FutureLearn. Um, um, it says some guiding principles at the end, but actually um, I couldn't really, I couldn't really kind of distill it, so I've come up with some questions. Um, I've nicked a, a quote here from Mike Bracken, so sorry to steal another GDS moment. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, Mike Bracken said this in a, a talk that he gave recently at the Coding for America Summit um, in October. Um, it's on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, watch it because it's really, really good. Um, it just kind of talks about the history of GDS um, in a in much more kind of macro way and why it's important and how there's a bit of stuff. Um, but I guess it resonated with me regarding some of the questions we had earlier as well because um, I think part of organisational change is you can't keep you can't just talk about what you're going to do you have to actually do it until what you've done is so huge and so impressive that it just kind of makes all of the dissenters irrelevant you know because what they're talking about is is long gone and you've kind of already replaced things underneath them um, it's kind of you know the best fuel really for change is to make really small unignorable public tangible success um, which kind of gives an irresistible glimpse of a future. Um, so around that, you know, why have a process? I mean, lots of startups, right, succeed without really having any particular process that they follow. I mean, um, Snapchat just got, um, I think I read in the news yesterday that um, Facebook offered $3 billion to buy it. And the 23-year-old <laughs> CEO said, nah, actually, oh wait, it's cool. You know, I don't know, how many of you use Snapchat? How many of you have used it? 
couple, go and have a look. It's worth $3 billion. It's, um, it's basically, it's, it's, I find it really annoying, but maybe it's my age. So. Annoying. <laughs> it, I think it's used for other means by a different generation, but um, it's essentially a messaging platform um, that allows you to send really short video messages to, to other people, and they it can only exist for 10 seconds. So when you play them on your phone, you get one chance to look at it and then it's gone. Um, and because I have a memory of a fish, that's no good to me at all, because then I can't remember what it was. Um, you can imagine what it's used for. It's worth three billion dollars. Um, so, that's, it's, a, it's a good question, why have a process at all? Because I think that actually, when you start any project, it should really, it should really be a case of what we're trying to deliver, not what have we always done, and that happens that also happens in Agile teams that I've worked in. It's like, oh, we use this process to, del to deliver software. Let's do Agile again. It's like, well, really? And will that work with this set of people and for this particular outcome? It's always worth asking that question up front. Um, but for me, Agile is, the things that I've really taken out of it that work for me is you know, making something that works really quickly, um, nurturing really excellent communication, and that's not just within the team, but that's also with your users. Talking to them as soon as possible about things that are real, um, and then embracing change. And I think that as long as these three things are happening, then you can pretty much say um, that you're agile. What is it not? This is a question that I ask a lot. In um, I, I like to come at things from the other from the other angle. But what is it not? It's not a replacement for a good, passionate team. If you don't have good people, um, generally your project will not go very well. So you need, it's not a replacement for that, but it will help you work out where your team isn't working quicker. Um, so you can, you know, if you, if you start a project, you run one sprint, it's two weeks long, three weeks long, one week long, whatever your iteration length is, you will, you'll be able, because you have that point where it says, right, inspect what you're doing, you'll be able to work it out. The key thing is having the guts to then change it at that point, or whether you say, oh, we'll just wait for another two weeks and see how it goes. That's the bit you have to kind of resist. And that's about having a good, having, um, good leadership in the team as well. Um, it's not wholly suitable in all environments, but there are loads of bits of it that are, and you can take them out and put them into other projects, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and it's not easy. It's really not easy. And um, it's not easy at the kind of day-to-day -day level, it's not easy at the uh, management level, and no one's got all of the answers to any of the questions, but there are certain things that make it very easy. easier. Um, um, so, ten things I have learned. This writing is tiny, I'm so sorry. It says, in no particular order, through the medium of song. I'm not going to say, promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, really, it's not a show. Um, so, um, in at number 10 is Road to Nowhere um, by Talking Heads. Um, having a regular time to reflect and challenge the direction of travel is so important in Agile projects, and it's just important, you know, how often have you seen a strategy paper that's published like once a year, or, or um, a roadmap that's published twice a year, or something like that, and then people are like, oh, that's it, right, we'll just do that. Um, that really annoys me because you often, you get to a point where you know suddenly the work that you're doing, where you, you have a new opportunity that doesn't fit with that, and suddenly you have to kind of squander it. Meanwhile, someone's made Snapchat. Just saying, I'm quite annoyed that I wasn't the person to invent that. Can you tell? Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't give you, you know, it doesn't make you work more quickly. The agile won't make you necessarily deliver projects more quickly. Like the work that gets done will probably happen at the same rate. It's just that you have the chance to influence it more often, and that's you just have to take it. I mean, case in point recently came up. Um, we just launched the FutureLearn platform. I'll explain a bit what it is now, because otherwise it won't make sense. Um, FutureLearn is a, it's an online platform for learning, and uh, it's kind of all it's aimed at all ages. Um, the courses that we run are from most UK universities, but we also have some international partners too. Um, and they're generally six to eight weeks long, something like that, and they take about two or three hours a week. Um, so they're kind of things you can dip in and out of. Um, it's supposed to fit around your life. It's designed for people who are either really keen at A-level and they want to kind of get themselves to, to a university standard. It's aimed at people who want to start a second career, aimed at people who are just really bright and interested and have uh, no particular kind of 
end to it. They just want to learn. They just really love learning. And there's, we have people from age kind of 14, 15, all the way up to 91 years on the platform, which is great. Um, but <coughs> the, the problem with that is that sometimes they say things you don't want them to say. So obviously we've, uh, we have moderation in the platform, so um, we have a lot of social interaction. And um, we planned a whole bunch of user stories around, right, OK, so as a moderator, I want to be able to moderate this, I need to do this. We started to implement them and thought, OK, well, we've got a few here, and that'll give us the really basic stuff we need. Let's stop. And then we launched our first course, thousands and thousands of users, and we had about six reports. So we are like, right, OK, let's just not do any of the rest of that stuff, and let's do everything else. Um, I mean, all of this is probably, you know, it's all stuff that you're all doing, but it's just, I think it's really important that you never stop doing that, and never always be kind of looking at what's coming up next. Um, the other thing about kind of the other thing about that is um, <coughs> agile. Actually, I find as a product manager um, helps me to create a really robust roadmap. Um, and I think road mapping is really important, even though you might change your priorities quite um, aggressively. One of the things that I've done a lot over the last few years is. Um, you know, breaking stories down, breaking requirements down into stories, and then retrospectively looking back at them to see how big a certain area of functionality turned out to be. So, um, we have a roadmap of future learning, it has a whole bunch of ethnic things on it. Um, we uh, break all of those down into stories and we sort of t shirt size them before we even estimate the actual individual stories themselves. So, we have a kind of epic level and then we have a story level. The epics, <coughs> we sort of, we clump into small, medium, large, and extra large, and it turns out that actually when we've gone back and looked at the data, um, points-wise, this is sort of roughly where they come in. So we generally, you know, an extra large will have maybe, you know, 15 or 20 stories that we implement until we consider that feature to be pretty much there for where we want it to be at the moment, and they might change in the future. Um, but over time, the team that we have has got really good. It took about it took about six sprints. So for us, that's twelve weeks. We run two we run two weekly sprints. Um, but after about three months of running the project, even considering <coughs> coming out in and out of the team, adjusting team strength and things like that, we were able to um, very easily kind of be able to say, right, okay, we think we can complete this sort of amount over any kind of quarter, um, <coughs> which we found really. We found really, um, well, I've found particularly good. I've done this in other places as well. But, um, and this is this is only on one project. It's very easy to do this, but you can see how this might scale up as well. We, the way that we run our roadmaps is that we have a very, very specific kind of idea of what we're going to be doing in the next six weeks. Um, then we have a broader idea of what we're going to be doing in the next quarter, and then beyond that, it's much more up for grabs. But. It's very. We haven't actually missed any of our kind of feature deadlines at all since we um, launched, and mostly that's because we're able to see pretty much what the team can deliver through estimating. I don't know how many of you are estimating kind of using Fibonacci. That's how we do it. I can give a really quick overview of that if anybody needs it, but I'm sure we're all there. Or we can talk about that later. Um, it's important never to present this stuff as kind of a done deal or a Gantt chart. Like we will do this because we always present it as we might do this. Um, and the stuff that's over here, we probably will do. And in fact, we've got quite a lot of this in play at the moment. This stuff, less so. These are examples I, I'm not able to share our roadmap, unfortunately. Um, and um, stuff that's beyond that, um, we don't know. We'll come to it when we come to it. Um, number nine is money, money, money. Um, the other thing about being able to work out roughly um, how many points you can is you can really you can be quite hard nosed about that, and you can say, right, a team this size can complete this many points, therefore it costs this much um, per point or per feature to deliver something. So you can you can be quite <coughs> you can be quite ruthless about it. And as soon as you know that you know your eight point story, which is as a user I want to be able to do you know go down a slide or something lovely, is going to cost you you know thirty thousand pounds. That's a slight exaggeration. Um, then you really can prioritise that quite effectively. And it's another, I mean, you know, for very commercially led projects, that's quite useful. I mean, um, when uh, I was at Channel 5, we operated on a 
um, a cost per story point model with agencies that we would employ, uh, employ to do our work. So we didn't have an in-house development team there, but we had a number of digital um, <coughs> products that we ran. Um, whenever we would um, do a large project, we would essentially buy a pool of story points, and then that was done on, a, on the basis of what we completed in previous projects, and then that would sort of whittle away as we went through the projects. But because we had done that, um, and on the next, the next project, the next project, that story point cost would change. Um, it was really good. As a product manager, I really, really enjoyed that. And it also meant that um, it kind of incented our agency to deliver as well, because if they didn't deliver the story points, they didn't get paid. Um, <laughs> and I don't know how well that worked for them overall. I, I don't think, I mean, I've certainly not really come across that with any other um, companies. Um, but it gives you the power over the money you're investing, and I think that that's really important. Um, number eight is, um, I want it that way. Um, does anybody know the next line in that song? It's tell me why. <laughs> um, and I think that what Agile does really well, and this, and it works well, very well managing up, is, um, you know, when you have a really engaged team, everybody on it, not just the people at kind of management level, everybody on it, you know, developers, your testers, your kind of UX people, they'll be asking, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it that way? Um, and it just becomes a kind of a tour de force. Like the, the fact that, you know, user stories are used so much and, you know, pervade everything that's uh, good about Agile. Um, it just means that you never get to, you never have to work on the stuff that, um, is you, you either think it's pointless or it's kind of you know a strategic thing because your CEO only wants it, you know, because you've just got this weight of of evidence and the process kind of really pushes back on that so strongly. Um, and I think also the fact that it, when we run pro when I've run projects this way, especially at Future Learn, actually, the rate of delivery and the rate of delivering things in the right order just about you know when. We've, we've delivered a platform that just about hangs together, we're adding the features in the right order, we're prioritizing, we're really questioning every single user need to work out if that's something that's gonna affect a lot of people or a few people later dumping that away. Um, it means that generally people um, will leave us alone to do that. Um, it's so funny how we don't talk anymore. Um, <coughs> one of the things that we did at Channel 5 was um, we had those, uh, uh, a sort of digital management team um, of about six people and um, I was responsible for um, the production team, there was someone responsible for technology, someone responsible for content, pretty standard kind of um, split in that sort of organisation um, and we've, I've, we found that it was quite a tense, um, we had these kind of weekly management meetings which were quite tense so we started to apply some of the um, agile principles to way that we work. So we would have a fortnightly um, uh, planning and retrospective sessions to talk about things that as a management team we've done, um, things that were going well, things that weren't going so well, uh, and then we would <coughs> talk about the things that we plan to do for the next two weeks and how that would then play out over the next few months. And we were really ruthless with what we could and couldn't deliver. And by <coughs> making that promise to all of ourselves, it was just really, really powerful. Um, and it also meant that we would have stand-ups and when one person was drowning in some sort of horrible contract negotiation that meant that they couldn't do the other things, you know, we would swap out and people would be able to pick up their other things, which was, you know, at management level you don't often see that sort of thing, but actually cross-skilling your management team is quite important as well as having like a cross-functional, um, uh, you know, delivery team, I guess. Everybody's delivering. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to skip over this one a little bit because I think Emily covered this and I couldn't find a song title that worked with scaling um, so this was the closest that I could come up to the other thing is that's a brilliant picture um, but um, you know, Scrum does scale really well I think um, as long as you've got really good communicators in the roles where you know, those teams overlap and um, you know, in the past I've done this by work, having multiple teams that kind of swap resources in between each other so there's good knowledge about kind of the whole domain as a whole. Um, scrums of scrums, all of that kind of stuff. It does, it can work really well. I mean, I've never myself worked in a huge kind of um, massive department like GDS which is transforming has hundreds of projects, not all of the software but there's lots of delivery teams there. Um, Spotify have, um, have a lot of documentation about this which I really recommend reading if you have a, a, a product development 
that's so really good. I've borrowed a slide from you later to kind of talk, um, talk about. Um, but they they kind of really made it quite a massive multiplayer on online gaming stuff. So it's all my guilds and stuff that I don't understand. Um, uh, don't look back in anger. So retrospectives don't have to just happen inside an agile process. It can apply to anything at all. Um, I spent a brief stint working in advertising before realising that wasn't really my bag. Um, but uh, I worked for an advertising agency called Poke, and um, we they ran an awful lot of quite fraught waterfall projects with agency clients. And this is an area that I think is really interesting. I'm not sure anyone knows how to crack it, but working. On trying to apply agile in agency is quite tricky, but there are certain things that you can do very easily. Um, this is a picture of a project retrospective, um, so a whole project retrospective um, that we ran, which was, um, I have a way of doing this, which is basically just drawing out the whole timeline and then we and then plotting kind of happiness lines along it. So um, if you draw your line that goes up, it means you're happy. It's a bit like the worm. On, I don't know if you've ever seen the political broadcast, it's a bit like the worm that goes on those. And it's just really interesting to foster empathy between the team. This is a waterfall project, right? So you've got all the, you know, <laughs> this, the person who's writing there is the creative director. So she and the planners are having a terrible time at the beginning, trying to get the brief organized. And then suddenly it's great, until the very end when it's wrong. And then, you know, the developers are like, oh, this looks great. Oh, no, there's no time to do it. But, um, so, and it's all classic stuff. But the thing is, because people are kind of so busy on other things, it's actually really useful to kind of, um, to promote empathy with the project, even if you know having a client who's just not interested in working in an agile way at all, and they just want to be, um, they just want to tell you what to do, or and then change it the next week. Um, it's it's quite useful. Um, let's get physical. Um, I like the video, John. Um, I spent um, a couple of years working um, with uh, Berg, and we created a product called Little Printer. I don't know if any of you know of that. I think we've got one. <laughs> um, so Little Printer is a tiny connected um, device. Um, it's a printer. It takes thermal receipt rolls and it prints its own face and whatever else you would like it to. It can form a little newspaper for you every day. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and I came on board just as that was starting to kind of be a project and it was like not just a set of sketches and a notepad anymore. It's like, yeah, we're going to make this thing. I was like, I have no experience of physical things at all. But now I do. Um, so, and you know, I realised quite early on in that that you know I, I really like doing things in an agile way. I want to talk about you know how to do things in the smallest way. I want to put something in front of the user as quickly as possible. But when you realise you're making a consumer product, that's almost impossible, but not quite. So um, when I kind of delved into it a bit more, there's, there's loads of agile components to how this works, right? So. Um, not, notwithstanding the fact that you know, alongside this is a remote app that you use on your phone, which you use to control it and set up when things print out and all that kind of stuff. Um, of course, you know, physical. I mean, make physical manufacturing is so high stakes. If you get one thing wrong, it can mean that your entire batch is ruined or gets recalled. Um, and so you obviously prototype very, uh, uh, very regularly, and we because none of us had done this sort of thing before, we were all kind of coming at it new, so no one was, you know, we had to be absolutely sure before we put this thing out into the world. So we're constantly like revising CAD diagrams of how the thing should look. Um, this is us putting together a prototype which had orange insides because they didn't have any white at the factory when they were making it. They were like, fine, we need to get 10 of these together so we can take them home and look at them and work out what it's like to actually live with one of these things. Um, but really, you know, when you look at the project as a whole, we were pretty agile about it. I mean, this is a this is a lovely um, set of set of sketches here. I'm just going to talk through them actually. So, yeah, you know, I think that a lot of design is actually pretty agile. You know, drawing something on a piece of paper and showing what it might look like, and then showing that to other people and talking about it. That's pretty. That's pretty agile, and showing that to as many people as you reasonably can. <coughs> Um, so these are very early prototypes, and this is a kind of actual code prototype. We could pull it through and see what would happen. Um, and then this was some physical explorations of the form of it. Similarly, you know, in, in separate tracks, we were looking at how the basic electronics would fit together. What would happen when you printed out lots of large black things? Would that would that cause the um, printer head to overheat? Um, and then this is all of the packaging that was happening alongside it as well. So. 
although this project was essentially an enormous waterfall, it had loads of iterative bits to it. Um, and you know, we went through dozens and dozens of, of different iterations of the back plastic because we kept getting little flow marks like this one here. You have to come really close to see this, but there's a little flow mark there where the plastic is injected through this hole. I didn't know any of this before I started. Um, and then like flows around, and because this is an imprint in the in the in the metal mould, um, it has to travel further. So then the temperature of the plastic on either side of this is different, and therefore it makes a horrible mark. So you know we had to go through so many iterations of that, um, and then you know there's a whole bunch of immovable stuff once you've got all of that right, like radio frequency interference testing, um, and we have 32. Um, suppliers in eight different countries. That's my Gantt chart. I hate Gantt charts quite a bit rubbish, um, but I would draw all over it. But we also like this. I like this picture. I didn't take it because I'm in it. Um, but that's that was the Gantt chart. But then we had an agile board going alongside it of all of the things that we could be in control of, and then all of the stuff that we couldn't was kind of. Um, and I think that that's you know never give never give up. Always try to be as iterative as you can around the size of things. Um, ch -ch 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 <laughs> I didn't say that thing. Um, I think that uh, if you are running a software project, um, deploy as often as you can. Um, we at so FutureLearn we've just passed a thousand builds, um, and every time we do a build, um, unless it fails, um, we deploy it straight onto our live platform. So we do about six a day at the moment, um, depending on who's in and who's hung over. Um, so you know, it means that if a bug is, is deployed to live, we don't necessarily notice it before we've actually our QA person has had a chance to check it. Um, you know, for huge sidewide stuff, we might hold off on deploying for a day and just check it all. But we, we try and deploy as often as possible. Sometimes that means that we end up with stuff that's broken, but then we can fix it really quickly because we haven't had to go through an enormous release process. Now we're able to do that at the moment on Future Learn because it's a really small team. And you know we're still in beta, so we have a little bit of kind of leeway about what we say about it. You can still you can still do this, and then kind of have more regular kind of you can have a release management process around it, which I think is what GGS does. There's a kind of there's a release team that schedules releases as well. Um, but we we think it's really important to do it really quickly. I think from an agile point of view as well, it means that um, you know we really are putting stuff in front of as many people as possible as much as we can. Um, an interesting thing here is that our marketing team don't like it at all because they don't have like we've released 10 new features to the platform it's like we did that little one the other day and we're going to do that one next week and then well, that one might be in two weeks time it might be in four weeks time it might be in six weeks time the product team won't tell me um so they kind of hate us <coughs> but on the other hand they like that we're doing everything quite quickly and they like that they can influence um, the direction of travel as well um but i imagine that's a question that some people um, people make the world go round. Um, I like Lucy Stansfield as well. Um, as, as, as I said, it's important to recruit the best people you can, and I think that another good way is that um, you know, using agile agile project methodologies and deploying often and getting things out as quickly as possible means that more people see your stuff, more people who are interested in doing the sort of work that you're doing come and see your stuff, and then they apply for jobs. If you strategize about something make an extremely long project plan and deliver it at the end. It's not quite what you imagined. You've, you've had all that time where those people weren't aware of what you were doing. Um, and we certainly found that at Berg on Little Printer. Necessarily, we wanted to keep that a bit secret and go a bit big bang with it, but we needed an awful lot of external help with it. And it meant we had to sign an NDA with every single one of them, and it was you know time and money, and we wanted to sell them so we could make more, and you know it, it made it quite hard. So I'm really glad that we are able to do that at, um, uh, Future learn. Um, you know, if you hire the wrong people or did people who aren't really passionate about your project, project, you end up with things like this. Um, I installed Windows 8 on a computer recently. I don't use Windows very much, um, but um, it previously had Windows 7 on it, and I put the Windows disk in like it, and I should, and then this came up. <laughs> My favourite bit of it is this: help me decide. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, you know, as I said earlier, no matter of process will necessarily <laughs> save you from this kind of thing. Um, you know, you just have to have people who are really passionate about it at all levels, and they hopefully never attack it. 
Uh, I put this in because I just thought Rhythm of the Dance is a good song as well. Um, you know, I think we've talked a bit about how much I like the, about the rhythm of um, Agile, but um, we are fortnightly review at, um, at Sprint, uh, that's fortnightly Sprint review at Future Learn is, is really popular. The whole company comes and actually it, turns, it ends up being a bit of an announcement session for anything else that's kind of happening or, you know, oh, I'm speaking at this event in a couple of weeks' time. It, it's become much more than just kind of how's the product going because the product is everything that Future Learn is really. Um, and the final thing, and the, the uh, Number of marks you will have noticed it's a zero indexed array, so there's actually 11 things, not 10. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's a, you know, that fortnightly thing is a chance for us to reflect on good work that's done, and it's important to celebrate even the tiny successes there, you know, where we've accidentally done a thing which meant that, you know, a few people, a few hundred people got in touch with us and we had to sort some of the things out manually. But even if we fix that, you know, that's worth celebrating. Um, and. Uh, the other thing is like all of these people are really miserable, so I don't know why they did this um, album cover. Um, that's enough album covers. I'm going to just really quickly went through what Future Learn's about, what we're what we're up to. Um, so uh, it uh, started life about a year ago. Um, we've teamed up with 26 universities, mostly in the UK, but they're from all over the place, and we're delivering <coughs> um, courses online for free, um, and they're six to eight weeks long. And they require about three to six hours study a week, um, and it was um, set up uh, by the Open University. Um, so our kind of our, our big things really in terms of the product of it is Open. We want to include as many people from all over the place as possible. We're based in the UK, so all of our courses are English at the moment, um, but that will change. Uh, it's responsive, so we have one product, and it, it's built mobile first, and then we go to tablet, and then we go to desktop, apart from when we forget, and then we have to remember to do that. Um, but actually, we thought that would be much more pain than it has been. Um, actually, it's 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 been very straightforward for us, and so we, you know, native apps are something that we're thinking about. But actually, we want to make the core experience as close as possible. The whole idea about FutureLearn is that you know it's lots of small little chunks of information, so you should be able to finish one thing on your desktop, get on the bus on the way home, do something else, come back, and then do the next thing. And uh, I'm just not going to touch it. Uh, so, um, and we've actually found it's really good. And so far, we're seeing about 23% of our users are coming from mobile and tablet. And we've had to grow. So, um, it's a number you can't really ignore. Um, it's social. So, um, we've got thousands of people from all over the place saying, Hi, I'm from here. It's amazing. And then it's telling us when things are broken, which is also good. Um, but, um, it's nice and social, and we've had to do it really, really quickly. So, this is a really simple, well, was a really simple timeline. I kind of need this light for this one. I can talk through it. Um, so, the idea was kind of born right at the very end of last year. There was a fireside chat, which has become legendary. I imagine there was a fire and some wine. Um, product vision was developed. Um, I actually joined the project in at right the end of March. Um, we built an MVP, we had three months to deliver something that might work, and then if not, then that was that. Um, and we thought we had something, so we put it out to alpha trials, so first with 300 users, then with 1,200, um, and they were just really tiny courses, also known as mini moocs, not mini milks. And then um, our first courses started in October, um, so we've moved really, really quickly, and now we've got thousands of people studying a, a weird and wonderful collection of things, which is great. Um, one, of, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was about kind of domain specific knowledge when you're working on kind of web projects, which a lot of agile projects are, and a lot of my experiences in web projects. So if you're not working on web projects, sorry. Um, but there's always, there's, there's normally, you know, how do you deliver a great web product? And then there's normally some domain experience that you're kind of applying to that, whether it's, you know, telly or, you know, publishing or, in our case, learning. And there's lots of different ways you can infuse that within the team. It's very rare that you find a, a ready-made product team that just knows innately your domain of kind of product as well, what you're actually doing. Um, and we get asked a lot, where's the pedagogy? You know, you've, you've, made a, you've made a pretty website, but is it actually made for learning design? Um, this is, um, we're backed by the Open University, which is, um, which is great. And this is uh, a chap called Ray Thomas presenting one of the first BBC OU programs. Um, in 1971, um, they, the things they know about distance learning, good grief, 
Um, and it's all good because actually a lot of that kind of classroom thinking, they've already tried to work out how they replicate that with distance delivered degrees and their, their own um, internal uh, online learning platforms as well. So we have um, a pedagogy team which is quite small but um, very, very good. Um, and how we integrate that, um, we took a lot of inspiration from the way that Spotify does its product development. This is a really complicated diagram. Well, it's not really, but there's a lot in it. Um, there's an idea at the top, it's worth, if it's worth prototyping, it goes into a kind of thinking team. Um, then it goes into a building team, then a ship it team, and a tweak it team, and there's lots of, there's lots of points where things might go in the bid along that journey, and I really like that, because we, we've been quite a lot of stuff too. Um, so we, we actually started out with this right at the beginning, before we had a, a full development team, and we kind of condensed it down a little bit, but we generally have, in terms of things we want to bring to future learners, the two sets of stuff, there's, there's more than that, but this is the kind of two core set, there's core features, things that people expect to have on a, on a platform, they're not necessarily learning related, they're just things we need to add. They generally, we, we kind of start specking up some UX and we involve the team of um, UX design development to work out what we want to do, we turn that into a set of user stories, we prioritise them, we evaluate them, we release them as quickly as possible, and we analyze how it's doing, you know, either, either by kind of really simple um, Google Analytics tracking or by getting user testing, depending on what we're doing. And then we iterate it, so we go around that loop. Um, with pedagogy, it's pretty much the same, only we have a different team who kind of focus on that stuff. That's their real driver, because that is so core to what we're doing. If we don't get the learning design right, then there's no point in doing any of it. So we have a learning technologist, we have an academic lead, um, and we have development in UX, but we swapped them in and out of this team, and magic happens in the middle here, and this Venn diagram kind of grows as we move people in and out of the team. So we run sprints um, every two weeks, they run alongside each other, and this interplay happens very regularly. It's quite easy to do for us, because there's only about 17 of us in total, um, but we're all based all over the place. There's a team in a tiny basement in Camden with no windows, which I've been in for eight months. Um, Lives in pale. Uh, and there's some in Milton Keynes, which is where the Open University is based. I get to go there quite a lot, that's great too. Um, and, um, and then a lot of people work from home a lot, and it still sort of works. Um, and it's a really simple diagram, and that's kind of on purpose. Uh, and that's kind of where I want to leave it. There are some open questions though, and these aren't things that I have answers to, but these are things that I have run into time and time again and I don't really have an answer to it. So I'm sure you guys might have some questions maybe uh, for me um, about the things I've just rattled on about, but these are some that I that I find particularly gnarly um, and I've got some reasons why. So the first one is agile design, can it work? Um, common things that kind of come up for us in our sprint retrospectives, and this is not just at Future Learners, it's happened a lot. Um, you know, with that, within Agile design, people are often like, we're too detail-oriented, we're not thinking about vision pieces, we're not thinking about what, we're not going to extremes and thinking about what it might be before railing back to it. And sometimes the process is so focused on delivery, I don't know whether somebody in the room found that as well, that you don't necessarily get the time or the kind of the ability to step back from that. Open question. I'm not really sure what the best way to solve that one is. Second one is um, in Scrum is sprint a good word to use because it just implies that you have to just run at everything. You have to run at every single user story, get it done as quickly as possible. There's no time to soak in anything else. Do it, do it, do it, deliver, um, you know, start the next one. And the word sprint I think is kind of a problematic in that, especially at a management level. Um, and the third one is, can Agile work in a client-agency relationship? Um, because I've worked in, um, I've worked in on client side, I've worked in agencies, and uh, I've only ever seen it work once or twice. And uh, I'd be really interested if anyone's got any experience to kind of share on that. Uh, they're all huge topics, probably. Well, this is the last one especially. Um, but yeah, I'll stop talking. That's it.